good afternoon, everybody. So I will uh, present uh, the plasma sphere as requested by the committee of uh, this training school. This is the outline of my presentation. I will give a long introduction as it's the goal of this lecture. And then, uh, so I start with the Earth magnetosphere, the inner magnetosphere, then the plasma sphere. So some uh, slides or presentation uh, will be a kind of repetition of what I've presented Stefan earlier, but in a, sometimes in a different way. Then I uh, will speak more precisely about the plasma sphere and uh, its density structures and the waves that occurred and are observed in the plasma sphere, and in particular the Whistler waves, which are very important and can be used uh, to have information about the plasma sphere, which will be the second part of my presentation, uh, with observations of the plasma sphere uh, divided in two parts. Uh, first one about with ground-based instruments, and then with instruments on board uh, satellites, and I will present data from four different missions. Uh, and then I will present some simulations quite shortly and uh, models about the plasma sphere, and then a link of those data sets and models with the PITIA uh, NRF project, and I will give uh, some conclusions. So first, uh, the Earth's magnetosphere, as already uh, presented by Stefan in the previous lecture. So you have um, here the magnetic field of the Earth, which is uh, originally like a dipole with the magnetic field lines going out from one hemisphere and going toward the other hemisphere. But the Earth and its magnetic field are uh, in relation with the solar wind uh, coming from the sun, as you can see on both animations in the bottom. So those animations show the solar wind going through uh, towards the Earth and modifying the shape of the magnetic field of the Earth. As you can see on the direction of the sun, it's compressed towards the Earth and elongated in the other uh, direction. And then it creates uh, what we call the magnetosphere of the Earth. And this second animation, I think Stefan shows almost the same with uh, some aura created uh, around the Earth. I let's finish the second one. Yeah. And so the magnetosphere of the Earth is, as I said, compressed towards the sun, so up to 10 RE. We call uh, this uh, the day side because it's towards the sun and it's elong elongated in the direction opposite to the sun and several hundred Earth radii. And this is the night side. And there is here a sketch of uh, this. So we have the solar wind on the left, the Earth's very small, so it's almost the same image as shown before. And you have several regions that has been presented and detailed before. So this is the magnetosphere and its outer boundary, the magnetopause, and the bow shock here. Um, not really seen here, it's the ionosphere which is uh, located between the atmosphere of the Earth, going up to 100-150 kilometers, and the magnetosphere which interests uh, me today. And in the magnetosphere, there are several regions in the outer magnetosphere, and uh, a special part called the inner magnetosphere which is composed by three regions. Some details here. And in fact, those three regions are uh, kind of collocated in the same uh, place of space. But uh, the main difference is in terms of the energy of the particles which are populating those regions. So there is the plasma sphere, which is here, uh, and the particles are, have an energy about, of about a few electron volts. So in current, it's uh, particles with energy between 10 and 100 uh, kilo electron volts, and the radiation belts, as a, there is an electron, as a proton radiation belt, so it's here, you can see four regions, and the particles have an energy in the order of uh, mega electron volt or several hundred kilo electron volts. Those three regions, uh, some of them interact uh, between, with them, with 
another one, so the plasma sphere with the radiation belt. I will show some uh, results about that later. And also with the ionosphere, which is uh, below and towards the Earth and between the Earth and uh, in particular the plasma sphere. Those regions have uh, various dynamics. For example, the plasma sphere uh, is reacting much faster than the radiation belts, which are a bit more stable. And the density is an important parameter in those regions, uh, density of particles, of electrons, uh, and it defines also, here I define those regions with the energy, but the density is also an important parameter, and I will speak about that later. So the plasma sphere. Uh, so it's, it's a region which has a toroidal shape around the Earth, so it's like a donut, but you can see this image here. And here you have another sketch with the Earth here. This is uh, some orbit of satellites and uh, um, a cut of the plasma sphere showing uh, is its shape. And its uh, distance from the Earth is at uh, between 10, 20,000 kilometers. As it's quite close from the Earth, it's mainly, it's more global motion, it's mainly in correlation with the Earth, despite some particles inside have different motions. I will not speak about that during this presentation, but it's a global motion of the plasma sphere, which is mainly in co-rotation. It's populated by cold uh, plasma, mainly 90% uh, uh, of uh, hydrogen protons, and they originate mainly from the ionosphere. Um, the outside boundary uh, is very important. Uh, you see earlier that it's characterized characterized by a drop of the electron density, and it's called the plasma pores. I repeat some characteristics uh, of the particles uh, present in the plasma sphere. The energy is a few electron volts, so very low energy. That's why it's quite, or it's very complicated to be detected <coughs> by a normal instrument um, like a spectrogram, spectrograph. Uh, and we need other instruments to detect those particles. I will show it later during the observation part. The temperature is around 10 to the power of 4 uh, Kelvin, and the density is varying quite a lot, between 10 to 10 to the power of 4 of cubic centimeters. There are two phenomena that uh, modify uh, the st structure of the plasma sphere. They are called erosion and refilling. So when there is an erosion, there is, I described some main features that we can see the plasma sphere. So the plasma pores is moving towards the Earth. This motion has a scale of hours. I will explain just later in which case you have those kind of motion. The density also of inside the plasma sphere is uh, changing yeah. and there is a creation and formation of density structures like plumes. And the second uh, phenomenon is called the refilling. So it's uh, then during this period, which occurred during several days usually, uh, the plasma pose is moving away from the Earth and the plasma sphere is uh, filled by particles coming, by ions coming from the, and electrons coming from the ionosphere. And those density structures can be uh, can be can move can be motion uh, with the plasma sphere itself in co-rotation or sub co rotation and then can be uh, removed in some way. And those two phenomena and activity um, changing the plasma sphere are directly related to geomagnetic activity coming from the sun and what we call geomagnetic storms. And a storm. Uh, it's not only affecting the plasma sphere because it's a major disturbance of Earth's magnetosphere. Uh, that occurs in case of uh, efficient exchange of energy from the solar wind into or with the magnetosphere. It's often associated with coronal mass ejections occurring at the sun, so you have seen some events, uh, some examples uh, earlier this afternoon. It's, uh, so those storms are often occurring in case of fast solar wind and under particular magnetic field conditions uh, with a strong BZ and negative BZ, so magnetic uh, comp Z component of the magnetic field. Uh, 
the, this geomagnetic activity, we use uh, geomagnetic indices to characterize it. And uh, those two indices can be modeled uh, as seen, as shown by Stefan Putz earlier, but it's also calculated from ground-based data. And in my case, usually I use uh, <coughs> ground-based, uh, those values of KP and DST and some predicted sometimes. I just wanted to show some, uh, another example of a phenomenon triggered by, triggered by storm. So you have here two pictures of uh, Aurora Borealis. So on the left, it's one uh, taken last year by a colleague of my institute in Norway, in a place uh, called in an observatory in Shibotan. And this one is, uh, I think, in the United States. And I have a movie made by my colleague that I wanted to show you. So it's, uh, he's working on uh, Aurora, and he's working on the polarization, and he's now this week in uh, Norway to do some work and as it's taking nice pictures and movies. I wanted to show you this one. And it's a success, it's not a movie, it's a succession of images taken uh, every four seconds, I think, and grouped to make a movie of, uh, I don't remember, one hour maybe of uh, uh, motion of aura. And you can see that it's very dynamic. Now I'd like to introduce one parameter call L, called uh, the L parameter or the Michael Wayne parameter, which it's uh, appro approximately the geocentric distance uh, from the Earth, so it's uh, computed or it's defined in Earth for the E. <coughs> and uh, if you look at this uh, figure on the top, uh, this uh, parameter describes a set of magnetic field lines and here it's shown as a dipole because it's uh, built on the dipole situation. Uh, and uh, this it describes this set of uh, magnetic field lines which cross the magnetic equator here at a number of r 4 d so 1.5, 2, 3, 4, 5, and this is the L value that uh, we uh, use to uh, study the plasma sphere. As I said before, there is a links between the plasma sphere and, uh, and the plasma pores and the radiation belt boundaries. And uh, we have made several years ago a study of this link with using the cluster data. And on, vi on this animation, you can see that the two regions are, as I said, collocated with the plasma sphere in purple and the two radiation belts in red. And this animation shows different uh, geomagnetic activity as shown by the arrow here. Just come back if I can. So this situation is during low activity. Oops, sorry. And you can see that the plasma pose is close to the outer boundary of the outer radiation belt, but when activity increases, there is a motion of this boundary towards the Earth, and you can see that it comes closer to the inner boundary of this outer uh, radiation belt. <coughs> now some words about the discovery and history of the plasma sphere. So it, it comes back to the late 40s when a uh, UK scientist called Owen Story he uh, studied Whistler waves that I will uh, present uh, or explain what it is in a few minutes. And uh, from ground-based observations of Whistler, he uh, inferred the existence of a medium uh, in near-Earth space to explain some uh, strange, as he said, propagation of Whistler waves along the geomagnetic field lines. So there was something which uh, perturbed the pro Radiation of Whistler. And about 10, 15 years later, a Russian scientist, uh, Green Gauss, uh, used data uh, measured by uh, a spacecraft, uh, which was dedicated to uh, study the moon, but on the way to the moon, there was some uh, data taken, and he um, could observe 
two facts. So origin of plasma density comparable to uh, the one um, identified by story, and also an unexpected fall off of this density. So here on the figure, so this is uh, with the dots, it's um, kind of, it's a, I know, it's a measurement. And then you can see that here you have one situation without fall off, and here the density falls quite quickly to uh, much lower density. So this is the density, and this is the geocentric distance of the Earth. And at about the same time, <coughs> uh, in the uh, United States, uh, Don Carpenter used data, again, from Whis Whistler ground-based receivers um, to identify the uh, same kind of drop off of the density. So this is observations of the Whistler. You will see some spectrograms later with the same shape of uh, uh, typical waves. And from that, it can, it can derive uh, the density, and on this plot here, so on the bottom plot, this is the density as a function of geocentric distance, and here you can see that there is no sharp uh, decrease. It's quite monotonous, the decrease of the density, but in this situation, there is a sharp decrease, and he called it the knee, a knee, and uh, it's, uh, before it was called the plasma pose, it was a carpenter knee. Uh, just to finish the story, we had in Brussels at my institute a meeting, uh, a several days meeting in 2007, and we invited uh, Mr. Carpenter, who is there, uh, to present his historic, historical world, and he was still working in, in, with science at that time. And, uh, and then two years later, we edited and published a book on the Earth's plasma sphere with observations uh, from two missions that I will uh, present soon. Uh, in 2000, uh, NASA launched an, an, a mission dedicated to the plasma sphere called IMAGE, uh, and this mission helped to de describe, present, and give names to density structures in the plasma sphere. So this is images of the plasma sphere taken by one instrument, and you can see different structures uh, and names. So maybe it's not really visible. Yeah, yeah. So this is called finger. So it's an hole in the in the global structure. Uh, here you have also another hole, but in a different shape. Uh, there is something called the shoulder. So there is just a decrease here. This is a plume. I will also speak about it. So it's an extension of the uh, plasma sphere. There is also the notch granulation. So it's different words uh, describing density structures in the plasma sphere that have been uh, more defined uh, at the beginning of uh, 2000. Thanks to this first mission taking pictures of the plasma sphere. There are also uh, many waves, electromagnetic waves in the uh, magnetic sphere, in particular in the plasma sphere. Uh, this uh, sketch shows, uh, again, the magnetosphere, so with the magnetopause, and uh, the inner magnetosphere or plasma sphere region with different waves called uh, IS, uh, chorus, EMIC, it's electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves. Also some waves called magnetosonic and the Whistler waves, which are directly related to the plasma sphere discovery and studies, and now I will explain more in more details what is this, <coughs> what are those Whistler waves. So it's electromagnetic waves in the VLF frequency range uh, from 2 to 20, or about 2 to 20 kilohertz. And the human can hear some between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So in fact, if we uh, transpose this uh, wave into an acoustic signal, uh, it gives an impression of whistling, and I can you can up here. May 10th, 1996, hour zero, minute 16, whistlers. So you will see a, a background noise and sometimes something like a whistle. And this is, uh, oops, I know this. Is.
the University of Iowa's Polar Plasma Wave Instrument. Wideband receiver audio data. So it's from a, it's data taken from a satellite called uh, Polar uh, by uh, NASA. Uh, so th those waves are created by lightning storms. So it's purely natural waves. And they create in one hemisphere and trans uh, transform into spherics. And then they can propagate along the magnetic field line towards the other hemisphere. So like you can see here and going there. So if there is a lightning storm creating this whistler in one hemisphere, we can detect at what we call the conjugate point of this um, of the magnetic field line along which it's uh, traveling. Uh, and during this way, it crosses the uh, equatorial uh, plasma sphere. That's why it's, in, it's interesting because we can uh, derive the electron density from each whistler, we can have a value of the density along the field line in the equatorial plane and in the plasma sphere. Because the propagation time depends on the plasma density along the path, uh, along the travel. <coughs> May 10th, 1996, hour. Not again. Uh, I, I have a second sound for later. Uh, so now some observations of Whistler. So we have in um, my institute uh, installed two antennas. The first one is uh, in Belgium, in Uma, which is uh, about 70 kilometers south east from here. And this is the instrument here. So it's, there is a mast of uh, 12 meters uh, length installed uh, 13 years ago and on which we install two perpendicular magnetic loops, so it's those cables which form two squares of 50 square meters <laughs> in a perpendicular direction. And then there is a pre-amplifier to amplify the signal recorded by those uh, two antennas, and then a data logger to convert uh, into uh, digital uh, data, and then a computer to make the analysis. And this is a kind of result. So it's uh, a spectrogram, time frequency spectrogram. So on this, on the horizontal axis, you have four seconds of data. You can see that we have very high resolution. And the frequency on the vertical axis from uh, zero to 20 kilohertz. And the whistler that we try to detect in all this uh, data, it's this signal here. So this wave, which is and um, you can see that there is lots of noise. I will speak about that later. And what we can do with, uh, we can do several things with this uh, whistler. Not only de derives the electron density, but also we can uh, determine the source region of those whistlers because I told you that they travel along the magnetic field line. And so we can uh, use a network of lightning locator to find the lightnings uh, at the origin of the whistlers because we have very accurate time uh, of those lightnings and the um, whistler. <coughs> and then this is a statistical study. So the conjugate point in the southern hemisphere of our station in Belgium, it's south of South Africa. So this is uh, Cape Town is around here and Madagascar. And here on my mouse, it's exactly the conjugate point or almost exactly. And then you can see that the lightnings come from around the conjugate point, but not exactly and uh, more to the east of this point because there is also propagation in the ionosphere of those waves. We can do some statistical analysis. Um, here during eight years uh, of data as a function of time on the left panel. And so it's just the number of whistler detected by our antenna and on the right as a function of months. <coughs> and there is no, almost no whistler during uh, daytime. So from eight to 15, it's uh, uh, explained by a link with the ionosphere and the propagation of those whistler and less uh, or more whistler in spring and summer because there are more lightnings and thunderstorms in the southern hemisphere at this time of the year. So we have more whistler. Uh, 
more recently, so eight years ago, we have installed an antenna in Antarctica at the Belgian uh, station, uh, which is uh, in south, uh, so in Antarctica, but south of South Africa. It's not the same uh, antenna because it would be difficult to install and maintain such uh, antennas. So we, some colleagues from Hungary, built another type of instrument consisting in two search coils, which are in a waterproof box and put, uh, so this is the instrument on the left here, and put in this wooden box and with the cable for alimentation, everything. We installed this in antenna because we wanted a clean electromagnetic environment because our signal is uh, strongly uh, perturbed and polluted by many uh, things. Uh, and we need power on internet, uh, so it's better to be at, a st at a, in a station. And the latitude is not so good, but uh, it's, it's almost good because uh, we are at about five, L equal five, and uh, we can detect Whistler at this uh, magnetic latitude. So this is the same kind of, of plots. Uh, so here on the left, it's data from uh, Antarctica, and on the right, it's from Huma in, in Belgium. So you can see that the signal in Huma is much more perturbed. You have those strong lines here, which are uh, transmitters, uh, not located in Belgium, but far, far away, but with lots of power, and those uh, signals uh, might be some, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, um, communication, submarine communication. So we have this all the time, so it, our signal is much, much more clean in Antarctica. We observe also some chorus. I told, spoke, explained you that there are many ways uh, in, the, in the plasma sphere, and we can detect also the chorus from the ground. So instead of a, uh, a small shape like this, it's, it's a long, uh, it's a large, uh, large frequency, defined frequency bound, but during a longer time. So here you have uh, several seconds, and it could be uh, 10 seconds, 20. And it's also in the same frequency bound, so we can also convert into uh, audio waves. Maybe the sound was too strong. So you can hear, and it will be May 31st. May and this, the, the source of those waves are at the magnetic equator. It does not come the from... The University of Iowa's Polar Plasma Wave Instrument. Wideband receiver, audio data. It does not come from uh, lightnings on the Earth, but it's really created in space in the plasma sphere or nearby the plasma sphere. 31st, 1996, Sorry. hours. Yeah. Uh, those waves, they in fact propagate uh, not only along the magnetic field, but also in the ionosphere. So we can check that and look at uh, if some whistler detected at our station are also detected in kind of nearby station because it's between 900 kilometers to 7,000 kilometers. And during a period of six, uh, five, six months, uh, we obtained that 70% of whistler were detected in at least two stations. So another one than the Princess Elizabeth Belgian station. And we detected 10 whistlers in three stations, so one included at 3,000 kilometers. And from that, we can make some uh, density analysis comparison, uh, which we have not done for those cases, but it can be interesting to observe the difference because you can see that the whistler is detected so exactly at the same time, but the shape is different because there was more propagation for, for one whistler than the other one. <coughs> and one final, uh, Final goal, in fact, for all th those two antennas, which are part of a network of uh, about 35 antennas, it's to uh, derive the electron density in the equatorial plasmasphere for all Whistler events that are detected by the antennas all around the year. 
and this product is a product that should be delivered to a PTI Science Center. That's why I presented this uh, today. The analysis is not yet automatic, uh, but uh, we have done several uh, particular event studies, like the one here, where we computed the L value of the magnetic field along which the whistler propagated, and the value of the density in the equatorial plane. Uh, you can see that the L value is different from the one of the location of the station, and this shows that in, uh, especially in Antarctica, the propagation uh, in, through the Earth ionosphere wave guide, as we call it, is also very important. It's, it's not only along the thin line, because we can detect at several high radiations. Now some uh, satellite observations. So this image mission, so uh, at six instruments, uh, almost all uh, were images. This satellite has the polar orbit, so with high inclination, and taking uh, pictures of the plasma sphere from the apogee at about eight Ae. <coughs> and the period was quite short, so we can have images during several hours every 13, or uh, every 10 hours. And in fact, it detects not uh, the hydrogen, but the helium, uh, or the lights emitted, uh, scattered by the helium uh, plus, ions in the plasma sphere and creates those images. Uh, here there is a, a false color to help the visualization where you can see the formation of the plume. So here you have a quite kind of round plasma sphere and here you, what we call the shoulder. So you can see more clearly what I explained earlier. And there is, uh, during this time period, a uh, geomagnetic storm creating a plume which rotates around the Earth uh, with the correlation of the plasma sphere itself. The cluster mission, it's an ESA mission uh, launched in 2000 as well with uh, 11 instruments and four identical spacecraft. It's also a polar orbit, but there was no images. It was in situ data to take, to have information of the magnetosphere and the solar wind along the orbit quite long orbit because uh, with a period of 57 hours <coughs> and going from four area uh, at the perigee, the closest uh, uh, location to the Earth to 19 area. And on this figure, you have data from the uh, Whisper instrument and it's again electric field spectrogram. So you have the time on the horizontal axis during five hours and the frequency and for the four spacecraft. The frequency is from one to 80 kilohertz. And one interesting in <coughs> thing in this uh, uh, wave instrument is that we, you can observe a, uh, what we call a, a plasma frequency line, which is the f called FP. And this is uh, this, uh, this thing here and here. And this frequency is in fact excited uh, in the, um, by the instrument and we can uh, see clearly on the spectrograms and can do some analysis uh, to have uh, these frequency values along the time and along the, along the orbit of the spacecraft. And this frequency is very important because it's directly related to the electron density by this very simple formula. And then we can get the electron density uh, very accurately with this instrument. And from this density, we can derive the uh, plasma pose position, and in fact, when you have this strong increase here of this plasma frequency or this electron density, this is exactly the plasma pose. So we enter the plasma sphere until here. So the duration of the crossing of the plasma sphere is about one hour and a half. Sorry. <coughs> and from this density, we can do some uh, analysis of plasma pose position as a function of geomagnetic activity. So those two indi indices I introduced earlier and compare it with uh, <coughs> models because there are some models defining the plasma pose position which is called here uh, LPP. So there are three models here that we used and uh, on those two plots on the left, it's the model related, the two models related to the DST index, index 
pairing here as a function of time during two, hour, two years of data. So it's from April 2007 to April 2009. And on the right, the KP index and on the, during the same time period, and on the bottom, it's the LPP position. So in red, it's the one that we derive from the instrument, and in blue and black, it's from the models. And you can see differences uh, with the plasma pose uh, observed at higher L than models. It's mainly due to uh, the limits of the frequency of our instrument, uh, which limits the, the maximum value of the density that we can detect. <coughs> but it's maybe not so easy to see here because the plots are quite small, but the variations with the DST and KP are very well recovered. So when you have an increase of KP, uh, you can clearly see that the plasma pose is closer to the Earth from the model and from the observations. A more recent uh, mission uh, from NASA called Van Allel Props or AirBSP, Radiation Belt Solar no, I don't remember. It's radi radiation belt probes. I don't remember the S. Uh, it was two satellites launched in 2012 with uh, five big instruments. Uh, the main difference is the orbit of the satellites. Uh, they were very low inclination, so almost staying in the equatorial plane. So they were crossing the plasma sphere and they were staying crossing the plasma sphere in the equatorial plane instead of the two preceding previous mission. And the orbit was quite short, so we can have a cross, crossing of the plasma sphere every nine hours. And here you have same kind of, ins uh, always again, same uh, figure, uh, time frequency uh, electric field spectrogram. So here it's two hours of data, but the frequency is from zero to 500 kilohertz because this instrument has much higher uh, frequency range, which allows to have the much higher values of the plasma frequency. So here you can see, if you can follow my mouse, this is the plasma uh, frequency line, and you can go deeper inside the plasma sphere and with the plasma pose around here, for example, and around here, going out. And we can derive the electron density again from this uh, plasma frequency or for another resonance frequency called uh, upper hybrid frequency. Those eight uh, plots are different uh, plasma pose crossing by AirBSP <coughs> during several different days and to show the very different shapes of this plasma pose. Uh, for example, uh, on E and F, you can see here a very short and very well defined plasma pose while in this case there are lots of density structures and plumes due probably to geomagnetic activity. Sometimes there is no plasma pose boundary. You can see uh, no sharp decrease of the density, monotonous decrease of the density, probably after a very calm period when there is not, not anymore this uh, sharp decrease. This example, you have very nice uh, density structures and long. This is uh, a plume, but we can see also maybe here on this A. Um, <coughs> yeah, so you, you have very various uh, situations that we can see with this mission, which produce very nice profiles. And usually uh, in some studies, we say uh, to define the plasma pose automatically, it said that it's a uh, a location where uh, the density increased by a factor of five within uh, half L uh, scale. And if you use this criteria, it will not work uh, all the time because of this large variability. Present now an old uh, mission from the US also, uh, because this mission, this satellite called Dynamics Explorer 1, had a very nice uh, <coughs> sorry, po and powerful instrument an ion mass spectrometer and with uh, what was called a retarding potential analyzer which allows to, which allowed to detect uh, very low energy particles uh, which are present in the plasma sphere. It was not the case on cluster, for example. The instrument was less, uh, 
because it was not dedicated to this region, so it was not less capable to detect those particles. And it was possible to derive density, temperature, and uh, so a velocity of five ions. And one example uh, of data, so it was only one year and a half mission, years, one year, one and a half years mission, so, uh, but we get quite, quite a lot of data and can make some statistical analysis. And here it's a plot of the density, so on the y and the vertical axis, as a function of the L for the five different ions uh, color coded from there. <coughs> and you can see, so it's a logarithmic scale on the, on the vertical axis. And uh, you can uh, derive the density ratio in the plasma sphere and showing that, uh, for example, at L equal to 90% of the plasma sphere is uh, hydrogen particles and 9% helium. And there is an increase of oxygen uh, ions, an increase of its density around uh, 3, 4, uh, L equal 3, 4. And this is what we call uh, oxygen flowers. Just, I don't, yeah. We have also temperature information inside the plasma pores or what we call the plasma sphere boundary layer when it's not a strict and strong uh, decrease of density. There are two plots on the left, it's for the five ions, and on the right for two different KPs, so low geomagnetic activity and high geomagnetic activity. And uh, so there are, it's quite uh, constant values and similar for different ions and also for uh, small KP and high KP. So not many variations uh, for the, in terms of temperature as compared to variations in terms of density, much more uh, variable. Now some uh, simulations and models. Uh, <coughs> briefly, the, uh, the empirical model of the plasma sphere, plasma sphere developed at our institute by uh, Viviane Pira, uh, based on theoretical studies of Joseph Lemaire. So Viviane will present it uh, tomorrow afternoon. So uh, just quickly, it's based on a mechanism called the interchange mechanism and it's used an electric field model uh, made by the same person who defines the L parameter, and it needs uh, the KP index as input. And on this animation, which you can start now, you have two views of the plasma sphere density in the plasma sphere, equatorial plane here and meridional plane here, and you don't see much variations because this event was in case of quite low and not varying too much KP, but you can see some structures and shoulder rotating, for example, uh, and some variations in the meridian, meridional plane. Another model, um, <coughs> very recent, it's a neural network model, uh, which uh, try to approach the global evolution of the total electron density and the East waves amplitude, because uh, both are related and in the plasma sphere and in plumes in particular. And they train uh, their, mod their neural network model with uh, density and waves data from the imprecise uh, instrument uh, that you have seen some results uh, earlier on both the RBSP satellites. And here you can see the evolution of uh, the plasma sphere density here. Uh, so this is also equatorial plane as a simulation by Vivian Pira. And you can see the formation of a plasma spheric plume later on here and rotating. And also there are some east waves in this plume, which is a quite interesting uh, result. And on the right, bottom right, it's some chorus wave uh, intensity of really amplitude. Uh, and on the top, it was the evolution of the indices. So the, it's different than indices. It was a KP here on the top, uh, which goes from zero to nine. I forgot to say that, so the KP was quite high here. No, up to four, I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> a third model uh, called the plasma pose test particle. So it's a global plasma pose and plasma sphere uh, model, but it does not give the electron density uh, yeah, inside the plasma sphere. So here it's an animation uh, from this model during 
uh, crossing of the plasma sphere by the RBSP satellites and the cluster satellites. They were crossing the plasma sphere at almost the same time. So here you can see the orbit of the two RBSP plotted on the simulated, simulated image of the plasma sphere. And here is the four cluster spacecraft which have, as I explained before, very different uh, orbit. And we use this model uh, to explain the observations that we get from uh, those uh, six satellites. For instance, one satellite was not crossing this plume, uh, RBSPA, that you can see here because the plume has been formed a little bit earlier before the animation. And you can see that the plume is rotating but also expanding outwards and then the RBSPA satellite is not crossing the plume. That's why we don't see it uh, in the data that we get and this model can justify and explain uh, our observation and give also a global uh, context. So now the, quickly the relation with uh, PTIA and RF project. So uh, some of the data and models described in this presentation are available in the PTI NRF eScience Center. Uh, you will see uh, <coughs> some examples uh, during this week. The VLF densities are not yet uh, present um, because I'm late providing it and also because we have some problems with the automatic detection of and uh, transform of these uh, uh, whistlers into density. So for instance, the whisper density uh, there is uh, a page uh, in the PTI Science Center from which you can uh, have access to the density in the plasma sphere to, uh, obtained from this instrument. And also the 3D model of the plasma sphere as it will be presented by uh, Vivian Pierrat tomorrow uh, afternoon. Uh, you can note also that the KP in this, in that, in this is, uh, are also available through the PTI uh, Science Center as well as as well as other indices which are also useful for the plasma sphere. The AP index is sometimes also used uh, for plasma spheric studies. <coughs> Sorry for my voice finishing. Uh, so to summarize, so the plasma sphere is the extension, congregation of the ionosphere. Uh, its position and density structures uh, depend on geomagnetic activity and it's really related also to the presence or absence of waves and to the propagation are very linked to the electron density of the plasma pose and at the, in the plasma sphere. The dynamics and evolution of the plasma sphere uh, can be studied with ground-based and satellite observations, but also with uh, models. I presented only three models, but there are many more available in the community. Uh, and the plasma spheric density data set of uh, WISPER and in the future uh, from the VLF antennas and the plasma spheric model uh, of BIRA are available in the PTIA NRF Science Center. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>